The goal of this video lecture is to give you a general idea of what happens from the time you push the power button on your computer up until the time uh, you get a Linux login prompt uh, in the terminal. And this is really meant to be kind of a high level overview of this process. By the end of this, uh, there is no expectation that you'll be an expert, but hopefully you'll have a ge better general idea of how this process works and you'll have some good jumping off points to explore this process in more detail. So let's talk about the general overflow uh, or the general overview of this entire process. You're going to press the power button on your computer. At the time you press this power button, uh, your computer's BIOS is going to go through a, a hardware check and it's going to make sure that everything is okay. Next up, it's going to go ahead and launch a small piece of software called the bootloader, which is located in a special location on your computer's uh, hard disk. And the bootloader's job is to go ahead and look in other parts of the hard disk and try to find an operating system kernel to boot. And again, this is a fairly complex process, but um, the bootloader stage's job is really just to go ahead and get a kernel up and running. And in our case, that'll be the Linux kernel. The kernel does all types of initializations. The kernel handles, uh, remember, inner, uh, basically all the, the communications between, um, it basically understands how to uh, work with the hardware, right? So there's drivers that know how to talk to various um, parts of the hardware, the motherboard, the expansion cards that are in there, deal with memory allocation, and, and knows how to manage um, CPU resource all allocation. So again, the kernel really is that low-level worker for your Linux environment. Once the kernel gets itself up and configured in the way that it's happy and it's ready to go, uh, it will launch a process called init, uh, or a similar process, uh, which handles all of the user space configurations. And this is really where the system gets ready for the user. Everything from the, the BIOS, the bootloader, and the kernel is really to get the computer ready for the computer's own sake. And that initialization process is really the first time where you're going to start to see uh, the uh, computer start to set itself up uh, for the user. And once all of those initialization processes are completed, and there are many of them, depending on your system and what you've got configured, uh, at some point you will end up with a login prompt after the hardware has been configured and all of the services that are necessary uh, to get your user space up and running are then configured. And finally, you get a login prompt. Again, this is a fairly complex process, but one of the cool things about this process in Linux is you have the ability at every step of the phase to um, intervene and customize and see and learn exactly how everything works. So again, not to make you an expert in this process, but let's talk a little bit about how some of these things um, are relevant and, and some terminologies. And one of the things that will be unique in this discussion is um, I'll be using Ubuntu for the sample system, but what I'm mostly going to talk about is the kind of the classic uh, init process for Linux because it's the one I'm most uh, familiar with. But I will also mention um, Ubuntu uses a special uh, process for getting user space configured called Upstart. So I'll also mention kind of how the classical uh, Unix boot initialization process uh, maps to Upstart, which um, I'm not an expert in, but I can kind of tell you how it maps. And again, I'm a little old school when it comes to this stuff, but that's okay when it comes to running Unix. So all this stuff happens. Where can we find some information about this? Well, there are boot logs. And all the stuff that would normally scroll by on your computer screen when you boot a computer uh, could be found in your boot logs. And you will, without doubt, find your logs on uh, your hard drive in a directory called slash var slash log. And in there, you will be able to see a log called dmesg. And the dmessage log is going to contain all of your boot commands. There's also a command that you can run called dmessage that'll just dump that log to the command line. Um, so either way, you can run dmessage or you can go dig into the var log uh, system and take a look. So we'll jump over there now and take a peek. So on my prompt, I'm going to go to the var log directory and do an ls. You'll see that there's a number of logs in this directory. The one I'm most interested in is the dmessage log. And this contains information from my boot. You'll also notice there's some older dmessage logs. So these are archived logs. And if I were to look at this, I could just cat this or look at it using less. Um, or I could use the dmessage command. So I'll just, if I run dmessage from the prompt, it just dumps that uh, file to the, to the screen. And you see a lot of stuff, but that's not really useful. So um, what I'll do is I'll run dmessage and pipe it through less so we can kind of walk through this. And as you kind of look through this, you'll see that these are all basically the boot messages. As your system comes online, 
Um, it's a cool file to look at because you can kind of see how it starts to initialize all of your hardware. Um, information about your hardware is contained in here. Um, you'll see things like if you're um, doing the boot process, bad memory is found or other really, you know, kind of subtle errors. Well, that, that could be a big error, but any type of errors that might occur during the boot process as well. Uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, uh, is indecipherable to most people um, or might not be of interest to you, but can be helpful when troubleshooting certain hardware issues. So in, along with this process of once we say we hit power, uh, then we, you know, um, the BIOS checks the hardware, and then the bootloader is then called upon to go find a kernel and load the kernel. The message is going to give you what's happening during that kernel initialization process. Whenever you're using a computer, you can think of that computer having multiple capabilities to be in states of various levels of functionality, which is just a fancy way to saying sometimes you want to have a lot of services up and running, and other times you want to have less services up and running. And in a Windows environment, this is most often seen when you say boot into recovery mode, which is a very limited um, uh, uh, state of the operating system. In other words, it's, you know, only allows a single user. Networking is probably not enabled. A lot of drivers are, are disabled and you can go in and kind of troubleshoot the system. And Linux has this idea as well. And in the classic sense, we call these run levels. And run levels define uh, a specific, you know, level of functionality that a, that a computer is in or has at any given time. Um, over the years, this has uh, been redefined in many cases and you know it you'll have to check your distribution and in newer systems that use the upstart process um, there's really not there's 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 still a sense of run levels because there's still a lot of backwards compatibility but this concept of run level seems to be like it's it's something that might be going away slowly as the as we creep into the future but anyway let's talk about the idea of run levels so unix has this idea where uh, you can be in single user mode, which is a really basic recovery mode. So if you're having uh, your computer constantly crashes as it tries to load a driver, or if you think you've um, the computer's been infiltrated, um, you know, by in some case or been compromised, you know, you might want to boot into a single user mode where no one else can log in and you can perform maintenance tasks. So run level one is usually single user mode. On an Ubuntu system, um, your kind of basic run system is going to be run level two. And this is kind of running with a GUI, and you've got multiple people that can log in, and this is pretty much just normal usage. On Red Hat systems and other systems, um, that might also be run level 5. So notice that even in this case, you kind of get the same type of run level between 2 and 5, depending on the distribution that you're using. A run level 3 is going to usually be full multi-user with no X windows up and running or no GUI. So that'll just be a straightforward, that's pretty typical for server environments, so pretty standard run level if you don't use a GUI. Four is undefined. You could go ahead and define your own run level. It's kind of one available. And six is reboot. Your computer has a configuration file to uh, dictate what the default run level is. And uh, if you want to be really mean to somebody, you can set their default run, run level to six so that every time they log into their computer, it reboots. These are like kind of fun little standard Unix tricks that everybody pulls on uh, other uh, Unix users. Don't do that. But anyway, these are the different states and run levels that your computer uh, can be in and um, we'll take a look in a bit when we jump over to the command line to see how one can um, set what the default run level is and where you can find these things and what run level you're currently in. There's a couple different ways to boot into single user mode. Single user mode being again that, that kind of recovery mode equivalent to Windows and uh, the best and easiest way to do this is on a reboot um, when you are presented with your um, basically the logo of your Linux distribution, it will often be a, um, a command at the bottom of the screen that you know says press escape or press a certain key to um, interact with the boot sequence. You might get a menu, you might not. And in the case of Ubuntu, Ubuntu uses uh, Grub2 as its bootloader, and you could actually uh, interact with the bootloader and say at that point and select an option to boot into single user mode. Um, if that option is not available, there's also ways within bootloaders to get a limited command prompt that allows you to pass in some boot parameters as well. Again, not really trying to talk about um, specifics on how you would do this, but the idea being that the bootloader stage, once you hit the buy it power button, the BIOS does its check and starts the bootloader process, many bootloaders will present you with a menu that allows you to select an option um, to go ahead and boot into uh, various user modes or various different kernels if you have multiple kernels in installed. Um, so just know that there is some flexibility in the bootloader uh, phase that can allow you to, just like in Windows, select different uh, levels. 
So before we look at this, let's talk a little bit about, about this idea of run levels. You can change from one run level to another, and you will notice that you can use the command init or tell init to do that. So if I wanted to switch from run level 2 to run level 3, I would type init 3. Um, and if I wanted to go to run level 1, I would type init 1. And these are um, you know, pretty standard commands. So uh, I probably will not run these in the uh, video lecture, but init can allow you, while you are logged in and have root privileges, to change a machine's active run level. And uh, on more classic systems that don't use the upstart process, you can change the default run level of the system in a file called slash etch slash etsy slash init tab. Uh, on Ubuntu-based systems, you would be able to change the default run level in a file called slash etsy slash init slash rc dash sysinit.conf. And if you ever want to see your current run level, you have the ability to run the command called run level. So let's take a look at a few of these things uh, on the command prompt. So one of the things we can do is see what current run level our machine is in. And if I use the command run level, it will tell me that my machine is currently running in run level 2. And because Ubuntu is based on Debian, that makes sense because I've got a full graphical user environment up and running. Uh, I've got full networking, full multi-user environment. So that is in line with what I said before, that um, Ubuntu systems would have run level 2 as their full GUI multi-user um, run level, whereas, say, a different distribution might use run level 5. So again, everything's distribution, uh, distribution specific. Um, we can use the init command if I wanted to, along with sudo, to switch my run level. And I'm not actually going to execute this because um, it caused a problem last time I tried it. And um, so, but the really nice thing is you can have uh, kind of back to this idea with Unix that you don't always need to restart the computer or take it down. Um, you can actually just change run levels and change functionality uh, right within the system. So if for some reason you would need to do um, some system maintenance, you could you know make sure that all get all the users logged off of the system and without rebooting into you could just reinitialize or reinit into uh, run level one. And in run level one, um, you know you, there would, nobody else would be able to log in. You could do your um, do your work and then you could knit back into run level two and you should be back up and running depending on what you did. Uh, and again, the reason why me and knitting to run level one here might not work is is possibly, you know, my being new and not having a full understanding of the upstart process used in Ubuntu. So uh, again, th there is a different way to really start and stop functionality using the Ubuntu uh, upstart process uh, and um, definitely Google Ubuntu and upstart and run levels and you'll get some really good information on that so again um, kind of looking at the classical approach here so um, we can take a look at where this default run level is set and that default run level is going to be in Etsy uh, init if we look in this directory in Etsy init there's going to be a bunch of stuff in here but the one we want to look at is RC init. And so I'm going to take a look at that file. And I will say uh, less rc sysinit. And you will notice that in this file, this is where you can find uh, the default run level for the system. So again, back to just being mean to people. If you change that to 6, your computer will infinitely reboot. Um, if for whatever reason you decide to have a different run level, you don't want your computer to have a full GUI every time it boots, you just want to go straight into the terminal, you could change your default run level to 3, which should give you a full multi-user environment without the graphical user environment. Again, um, your mileage may vary on that, um, but um, you could give it a shot. So how are run levels managed? Run levels are managed um, a couple different ways based upon the system that you're using. In the classic init process, all of your um, enabled functionality in a given run level is dictated by a series of scripts that are stored in a directory or series of directories um, in the um, slash etc directory uh, and these are rc.d directories and we'll take a look at those in a second on the command line and essentially the way this works in the classic init process is that uh, you just have a series of scripts in a folder and uh, there are a number of folders that represent different run levels and uh, those run levels are linked back to the main scripts and those scripts or the links to those scripts have names that either start with an S or a K. A script that starts with a capital letter S starts a process. A script with a capital letter K kills a process. 
And then finally, each of these scripts will be followed by a number and a name. And the number dictates the order in which those scripts are executed. So you can change the order in which scripts are started and the order in which they're killed in case you have scripts that depend on other scripts being up and running um, as you go. And um, we'll take a look at that. It's a pretty simple process in terms of um, its design. It's pretty elegant and simple, um, but it is the classic approach. And what you'll notice is that even in an upstart-based system like Ubuntu, this um, naming convention is still utilized because it's backwards compatible. And again, I think everybody's just used to the classic way of doing things. Um, but what you'll notice is that upstart, again, even though it looks like the classic init process um, because of backwards compatibility issues and supporting you know, lots of different services that are expecting that process, um, we can look at and find um, upstart specific scripts in the Etsy slash init directory. And there are some specific files related to the upstart um, uh, process. There are specific like upstart. So just like these S and K scripts are going to be compatible with the old school um, init process. Uh, Upstart has its own way of having its uh, own customized services um, being defined and also which of those services should be uh, enabled or disabled based upon a given run level. And again, that's not really something I want to discuss specifically in this class. I'll, we'll kind of look at the classic scripts because that's what I understand the most. Uh, but the reality being um, that... Um, you know, depending on what your distribution is, it may or may not use Upstart. So just a couple of different options. The real key here is to know that run levels, how do things get put and made available in a given run level? There's just a script run. You say run run level three and a bunch of scripts in a folder get run to enable or disable the services that are supposed to be on or off at that run level. It's not, um, while it is a super complex process in the sense that there's a lot of stuff going on, um, uh, the, the basic theory of what's happening is not really all that difficult. So let's explore this, some of these directories on the command line. So if I go into my Etsy directory and take a look around, you'll notice that there's going to be a number of uh, directories in this directory <laughs> called um, various things. And here's a bunch of RC directories called rc0.d through rc6.d. And these directories uh, are corresponding to various run levels on the system. And again, this is all for backwards compatibility with the traditional init process. So at run level two, all the things that get started and stopped, we could expect to find scripts in there. So let's take a look at that directory. Oh, let's pull that up top so we can zoom in a little bit. And so what you'll notice is there's a couple of scripts in this directory and all of the items in this directory will be started because they start with the letter S. And the order in which these items will be st started is dictated by the number after the letter S. So kernel loops get started first, and then speech dispatcher, and then VBox add, and so forth, all the way up through the higher numbers. Um, again, if you wanted to have your own scripts execute at start time for this run level, you would just name them using this convention and drop them in here. One of the things that's important to notice, though, is if we look at what's actually happening, these are all links. And you will notice that all of these links that use the traditional uh, init process naming convention link back to the init.d directory, which is more of uh, the way that Upstart handles things uh, today. So you're still seeing this transition. And again, like I said, it's a little confusing, uh, even to me, because I'm so used to the old way of doing it. Anyway, <clears throat> this is why stuff gets started and stopped at a given time when a different run level um, is executed. And notice, by the way, that this isn't everything that happens at a given run level, these are some of the items. So again, the other processes that that are running on your system um, could be executed at any time in that brute process. And um, you know, uh, we could look through and see what all of these do. Um, RC local, good place to put some local scripts or some stuff that you want executed, or you could write your own scripts up to you. Anyway, um, that's the general idea of how run levels work and how your computer kind of gets up into a runnable state and how you have the ability to enable or disable functionality at a given run level. Um, just an overview, and um, also give you some ideas of, of the way it was done and the way it's being done in the future. And uh, again, this is totally not enough information for you to go out and administer a system, but hopefully it's enough information to give you a general idea what happens when your computer boots, and hopefully that can interest you to go learn some more.